Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, my name's Bob Ward. I'm the Policy and Communications Director at the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment that's based here at the school. Uh, it's my great pleasure this evening to uh, introduce Professor Graciela Cicilniski uh, as part of the Institute's public lecture series that uh, runs throughout the year here at the school. I'm going to start just by outlining a little bit about the schedule for this evening. Um, Professor Cicilniski is going to talk for about 45 minutes. We'll then have about 45 minutes for questions. And then at about 8 o'clock, uh, Professor Cicilniski will be going outside uh, where copies of her new book are on sale and she'll be signing copies. So I appeal to you that the usual group of people who come to the front to have a conversation with the speaker, if you'd like to try and engage her in conversation outside by the book uh, stand, that would be very helpful. Um, our speaker is Professor of Economics and Professor of Mathematical Statistics at Columbia University in New York, as well as Director of the Columbia Consortium for Risk Management. Uh, she's one of the form, uh, world's foremost scholars on sustainable development and the global, global environment, and she's held a number of prestigious posts um, at institutions other than Columbia during her uh, career. She's perhaps best known for her work on the Kyoto Protocol, and in particular the uh, role of carbon markets within that. And... Um, Quite a lot of the detail about her knowledge and her inside knowledge about Kyoto is in her new book called Saving Kyoto, An Insider's Guide to the Kyoto Protocol, How It Works, Why It Matters, and What It Means for the Future. And I find it, it's a very accessible account and very interesting insider's view of, of what is, uh, has been a very important uh, development in, in global climate change policy. Uh, she's also uh, authored this article in the current issue of Time magazine outlining a proposal to end the standoff between the US and China. So very, very timely in that respect. In any case, uh, this evening she's going to um, deliver a lecture on climate change. Are we heading for a new Cold War? So please join me in welcoming Professor Churchill Niski. trying to turn on the microphone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today. I uh, particularly welcome the students. Most of you are students, not all, as I can see. And the reason is uh, students are very important to what we're talking about. Because uh, my point of view is that the world is uh, yours right now. And there is a lot of work to be done and I want to explain in my mind, from my point of view, a map to the future and the power that you have in your hands to transform the situation and what's happening. A situation that is pretty hopeless, I may say, and it looks pretty grim. And yet, I want to give you this balanced view of how difficult and challenging it is and also what is possible. And if I manage to just... Uh, give you that message, practically speaking, then I would consider my, my mission uh, fulfilled, if I can do that with at least one of you, and I hope with many more than one. Uh, so please interrupt me if you need to. Um, that's the topic. Are we heading for a new Cold War? Before I start, talking about the issues from the point of view of the intellectual side, I want to give you an emotional feeling without words about what we're facing and why we care for it. And I think this is best conveyed by presenting to you a few pictures. Uh, before I start, w let me see, so, since I have a watch, a, a clock there. What time? It's 27. I'm going to 25 after. Yeah. Right. All right. 
So these are, this is what's happening with the melting glaciers and ice sheets in the Antarctica, sorry. And as you probably know, the towns in Alaska are sitting, are, are sinking into the warming sea because they were built on permafrost that is melting. And settlements are changing. These are pictures of melting glaciers in Antarctica. But of course, the same thing is happening in Europe with consequences for the water supply. This is from Patagonia, and I am originally from Argentina, so I've been there. This is Perito Moreno, the famous glacier. And that has changed the distribution of malaria as well, the warming trend. This is a picture that is in front of the cover of the book. And what is less known from China is that 25% of the land mass is desertified. The longest drought on record in Australia, the oldest continent on Earth. This is one of the consequences, solar farm in Spain. This is the Colorado River that feeds all of Nevada and California. Seriously, that doesn't make it anymore to the sea, the mighty Colorado drying up. This is what happens because of the draw of water, the lower water uh, that is mostly used for Las Vegas. And fires that you keep on hearing about from drought. And this is the implication to our cousins, our species that share the planet with us that are very close to us in terms of evolution, like the primates. Fifty percent of the uh, Caribbean corals are extinguished because the seas, having absorbed more CO2, have become more acid, and the corals are basic, so they are disappearing. And this is a question for you. This is, I took this from the Phantom of the Opera, if you know that. Uh, the, I, I don't know if you know the part of where the guy sings, this is the point of no return. I'm not going to sing it, but just want to <laughs> Maybe I should sing it. <laughs> and the topic of, the, call, of uh, the, the talk today, US and China, is this a new Cold War? Is this, is this a new Cold War all about warming? What are we talking about here? Well, you remember of last uh, century, we had a Cold War because of the nuclear escalation between Russia and the United States, and that went on for a long time until it was solved. Neither of them wanted to back down first. Well, here we are in a similar situation. The times are different, the situation is different, the nations are different, but it's equally and potentially a new Cold War because we are talking about escalating emissions of carbon that could produce a catastrophic effect for humankind, and neither wants to back down first. Question is, what to do about it? And that's what the talk is about. And then as part of this, you're going to say, what does it have to do with me personally? That's what I was saying about the students. And I want to show you what can be done, or with what could be done, and what you can do, and the way you can go about, and it doesn't mean you will want to do it, but at least we had to see a way through to the future. Although I must warn you right away, 99.9%, 99.9% of all species that ever existed on this planet have gone extinct. So what is the hope for us? Whatever the hope for us is, it's a pretty small probability. We've been around with our relatives for about four million years. And just so that you know, we are right now in an episode of extinction of the massive, the massive impact on the biodiversity of the planet is only comparable to five other incidents of biodiversity destruction, the last one of which, according to the fossil records, is a disappearing a disappearance of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. And for you to know, all the other five major extinctions were connected 
to climate change events. That's not the topic of his talk, but I wanted you to sort of enjoy this in the overall picture. Here is a summary. I want to talk about the world today. I want to explain why Copenhagen in 2009 is really the future. It's a do or die for the future. I want to talk about the China-US, whether it is a Cold War, and how to overcome the impasse. I want to talk in real terms what to do in Africa, Latin America, and particularly the small island states that are the most vulnerable and the ones that will face disappearance under rising, the rising seas, which is the most obvious consequence of climate change. I want you to know that although we keep on talking about small amounts, one, two, three, four degrees, the temperature changes in the poles are three times larger than on average, which means that if you have, for example, 5% temperature change on average, it's a 15%, it's a 15 degrees change in the poles. That leads to massive change in the ice mass, which when melted, rises the ocean because water has a larger volume than ice, and that could lead to rising the sea level of one meter or one and a half meters, under which we have really a disaster scenario for hundreds of millions of people and uh, we easily can go to, you know, New York can be underwater. The, more threatened, the most threatened cities right now in the world are Miami, Florida, with $3.2 trillion at stake from climate change losses, according to the recent report by the OECD. The second largest city is Shanghai, with $2.2 uh, trillion at stake in terms of losses. And for the first time in history, the problem is really global because by burning its own coal, its own fossil fuels, Africa, and a region such as Africa, involuntarily, involuntarily can cause trillions of dollars in damage to the United States, to Europe, and to Asia. So this is truly global, okay? <coughs> So I want to talk about the energy needs in the world and the next generation Kyoto Protocol. The Kyoto Protocol is the first, and I should say the only agreement that we ever had on emissions. It was signed in 1992, and among the signers was the United States. I should mention, I was there, that the United States was actually an important element in the creation of the Kyoto Protocol. I know it sounds strange, but it's true. Although then it became the biggest enemy, the most powerful enemy against its ratification. It became international law despite the opposition of the United States when Russia ratified it in 2005, very recently. In it, Industrial nations, the wealthy nations, agreed to limit their carbon emissions because the industrial nations that form 20% of humankind emit 60% of the global emissions. In introducing the carbon market into this protocol, and if you read the book, you will see that in the middle there is a personal account uh, of how this was done, how I did it, uh, working with the uh, Department of State of the US working with the lead negotiator of the protocol, Ambassador Estrada, Estrada Ochoela, working with the European Union, and particularly with the French delegation, and the head of the French delegation actually wrote a preface. I'm not sure it was the, the head, but he was a member of, an important member of the French delegation, I think he was the head, Jean-Charles Lucard wrote the preface of my book that you have. And the critical element of this, I want to tell you about the history, is that the protocol until the 11th and a half hour was not going anywhere. There was a mandate created in Berlin, the so-called Berlin man mandate, to reach an agreement in Kyoto in 1997. And yet, until the 11th and a half hour, the 16th of December, there was no agreement. And it is then that after years of lobbying, 
and designing and creating and working with the OECD and the United States and the developing nations, finally Jean-Charles Urquhart asked me to go into the negotiation room and I sat down on the steps and I wrote the words that he asked me to write because the US was on board with the market as a solution and so were the developing nations but not the Europeans. At this point the Europeans were favoring taxes. So I had to write words that would bring the Europeans in. You will see it all written in the book, and I did. And out of that, the big you know, uh, block in that system dissolved. We signed the protocol on the 17th of December, and the carbon market then was developed in great detail in the coming year. I expect something similar will happen in Copenhagen. You know why? Because we have a mandate for Copenhagen. It's called the Bali Roadmap. And it's like the Berlin Mandate. It says that we must reach an agreement in Copenhagen in December 2009. And this is only under those conditions can you expect the decision to be made. Before that, it is the incentive of every nation to procrastinate, and we are very good at that. That market is now trading $60 billion a year Interestingly, in, it has made transfers in just three years that are comparable to some of the biggest uh, charity transfers made during the decade of the 90s, which were 35 billion. 23 billion were already transferred from rich to developing nations, but not to governments, but to private projects for productive purposes that reduce emissions with the equivalence being approximately 20% reduction of the emissions uh, of Europe during that period. And the price per ton is approximately 25 to $30, and it oscillates. It's quite volatile, I will explain why. And it produces this price, a major incentive, because any large emitter is facing potentially a big bill. It's like a tax. But the difference with the tax is that taxes go to the government who decides how to disperse them. The tax in the Kyoto Protocol doesn't go to a government. It goes from those that over emit directly into the pockets of those who under emit. It goes from the bad guys to the good guys. And it doesn't go through governments. So it creates incentives for the first time in the global economy to reduce emissions. It puts a price signal, a price, in what is costing the world when we pollute it, when we pollute the atmosphere of the planet. But, in all truthfulness, the Kyoto Protocol is only a first step. It has no limits on the developing nation emissions that are 40% of the total, of which China is 18. The, cl the clean development mechanism that I just explained to you is what applies to the developing nations. They don't participate in the market because they have no limits, but they benefit because any investment from an industrial nation to a developing nation, private investment, that succeeds in limiting emissions and is certified to do so becomes a credit that investors get, which they then trade in the carbon market. And therefore, projects of this nature that are clean projects in the soil of developing nations are particularly profitable. You hear a lot about the cost of the carbon market, but you rarely hear about the profits that the carbon market generates. And that's what I'm trying to talk about. This is one of the biggest transfers for productive purposes between the rich and the poor nations. But China has gotten 60% of the transfers. Why? Simple. Because there is a perversity in the, carbon, in the, in the Kyoto Protocol CDM where this, these projects go to the nations that are large emitters. <coughs> because the projects are to reduce emissions. Africa as a whole emits only 3%. So it doesn't have much to reduce. 3% of the global emissions come from Africa. So how much can Africa get of these projects? Same thing about Latin America. As a result, the perversity of it is that this extremely important source of resources is going to the large nations such as China that emit a lot. That's something that has to change. Yet, the carbon market is now really changing the equations, it's changing, in my view, the evolution of capitalism together with other environmental markets, and is poised to become the largest commodity market in the world. And this means 
that with the carbon market in place, and I explained that in the book, uh, Lord Stern is wrong in what sense. There is no cost, net cost to the global economy from global warming. What do I mean? I mean that with the carbon market in place and with the right limits for what we're trying to achieve being agreed, some people will be better off and some people will be worse off from the carbon market. But the net change is going to be zero. So you could truthfully say that as far as, as, far as the global economy is concerned, with the carbon market in place, there is no cost to repair global warming. It's just a transfer from the people that overemit to the ones that underemit. And it changes the market value of the Earth resources. And here I want to quote very quickly, um, um, well, I will leave the quote for later on. Anyway, this is a market solution with equity. The carbon market is a market solution with equity because on the one hand, it reduces emissions from the wealthy nations, which are the ones that are responsible for all the global warming that we have today. Now, what do I mean by that? Okay, let me tell you what I mean, because sometimes it's not clear. It means the following, that if every person in the world would consume fossil fuels and will emit the same thing that an average person in a developing nation is emitting, we would have no global warming problem. I don't know if I'm being clear on this, okay? So historically, 80% of humankind who lives in the developing nations have emitted 40%, with a 60% coming from 20% of humankind, which has the smallest population and the smallest population growth. So limiting the emissions of the wealthy nations is reasonable, in the, at least for the present, but certainly not for the future. But Kyoto is only a first step. First of all, by its own design, like Cinderella, it becomes a pumpkin at the, at the uh, turn of 12. In the year 2012, poof, goes the protocol. And what I mean is that all the provisions finish. I want you to remember that so that you understand why Bali said Copenhagen has to be the final solution. I wanted to say, I wanted to go before and I will do so now, Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde once said, an economist is somebody who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. Do you know that quote? Okay, this is very relevant here. He didn't create the carbon market, but clearly from my mind, from that quote, he could have done so. Because what he was trying to say is that we are out of alignment between market prices and human values. That market prices don't somehow fit with what the human values are. So the carbon market, in introducing the price signal, forcing us to pay when we produce this global pollution, and overuse global resources, is addressing the Oscar Wilde problem. Okay? I, I want to say much more about that, but later on. In any case, the US doesn't participate. Therefore, Kyoto lacks control of 26% of the global emissions. It lacks limits on the developing nations' emissions in the future, which are right now 40%. Right there, 66% of the emissions are outside the protocol. Not that great. And now, this north-south issue that I already alluded to, okay, has become uh, present and geopolitically impressed upon us by the potential escalating war on emissions and potential cold war between the US and China. This is only to make the problem a little bit more difficult. We have thrown into this difficult equation the biggest geopolitical problem of our times, the potential transfer from one superpower to another. How much more difficult can this get? I just wanted to explain that I'm not ignorant of what's going on. And when I am optimistic, I do take into account all these factors. That's what I mean. Yet, there has been progress in the US. The US has been the most 
forceful opponent of Kyoto, particularly during the Bush administration, even though it was Bush who agreed in Bali to uh, come up to a solution in Copenhagen and to join the process. However, President Obama wishes to participate. California and other states, hundreds of cities and towns want to participate in the Kyoto Protocol. In 2007, the US Supreme Court delivered to the executive the power of enforcing emissions limits through the Clean Air Act. Global businesses and global investment banks, such as uh, Goldman Sachs, are making a killing out of carbon credits. And finally, unlikely, and this is what I call Kyoto Rocky II, going through ups and downs, all of a sudden, after all this opposition, in May of 2009, the US House of Representatives voted the energy bill. The energy bill says emissions limits in the US and cap and trade. Whoa, that's a change, OK? And the road ahead and the future global needs are about emission limits for developing countries, question mark, US participation in the Kyoto process, all of that in a situation where the world is now increasing energy use five to tenfold. So whatever we are emitting today is nothing compared to what we're going to be doing in 10, 20, and 50 year time. We're going to be doing five times more if we continue using energy from the same type of sources. The long run solution, as you all know, is renewables. Wind, biofuel, nuclear, geothermal, hydroelectric energy, but they're all limited in supply, and none of them can replace fossil fuels. Only solar energy can replace fossils. And less than 1% of the solar energy the Earth receives today can provide 10 times what fossil fuel energy is providing with known technologies. 89% of the, of the energy in the world today is fossil, gas, coal, and oil. 10% is nuclear, geothermal, and hydroelectric. And less than 1% is solar power, including photovoltaic and solar thermal. Therefore, to move to renewables is a long-term objective. But in the short term, it's impossible. It's impossible. There is no time to transform the entire fossil infrastructure that costs $43 trillion, according to the International Energy Agency, which is two-thirds of the GDP of the world. And it's not just a financial problem, OK? It's a matter of building infrastructure. So we need negative carbon. What is negative carbon? It's to reduce carbon in the atmosphere now, not just reduce emissions or level emissions, because that keeps on increasing the concentration of carbon. We are emitting 30 gigaton of carbon a year. Even if we level that off, we keep on emitting 30 gigaton. This doesn't dissipate. It can stay hundreds of years in the atmosphere. What we need is to get up close and personal with those carbon molecules and actually take them down from the atmosphere. And the Royal uh, Society has re just written a report about geoengineering supporting what I'm going to say now about carbon capture, particularly air capture. For the last 16 years, we have been using CCS, carbon capture and storage. That's misspelled. This is a C. But it doesn't suffice. Why? Because this cannot retrofit existing plants. So all we can do is use them in new ones, and it will perpetuate the fossil paradigm, because it is there to keep on using coal. If you read the Royal Society report, that is very recent. It came out about two months ago. And I can send you a copy. Just write to me. I'll send you a copy. It's about air capture. It includes geoengineering, including air capture and solid storage. Air capture means what? It means you put a machine out there that just goes chuku 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 and takes carbon down from air. There are several technologies to do that. This report shows that they are feasible, they work, etc. They come in different forms, different prices. And I'm involved in one of the commercial efforts together with the chairman of this company, who is Edgar Bronfman, and the chairman of Warner Music, who is now living in London. The company is called Global Thermostat. But there are others. The key point is that this type of technology can take carbon. And once you get carbon, you can transform it into ethanol or you can transform it into cement by mixing it with calcium carbonate, 
or you can use it for biofeeds, etc. Or you can take it as the oil companies do and inject it to increase petroleum uh, from any geological site by about 30%. So combining air capture with solar is critical. Why? Because if you use the heat of a solar, concentrated solar power plant, which is my preferred scenario, then that heat driving the process, the chuku chuku machine that I was telling you about, driving that process leads to emitting no carbon because it's a clean plant, and on top of that, becoming a carbon sink. So the, the, the project in which I'm involved is co-generation of electricity and carbon capture. The long and the short run require different policies because long run policies do not work for the short run. Yet any short run policy must accelerate renewable energy or it will defeat long term goals. So how do we move forward in Copenhagen? The first thing we must do is to diffuse or overcome the, the China US impasse. But the interest of the industrial and the developing nations which are represented by the China US impasse which is that China has no limit in emissions, and the US refuses to accept its role that it already signed in the Kyoto Protocol, unless China has limits. It's the Cold War syndrome I was telling you about. They are so opposed that once again we need a two-sided coin. We need economic incentives for the short and the long run. We need the next generation Kyoto Protocol past 2012. We need to bring aboard the US and the developing nations, the G77 group, and crucially, we need to assist small island nations, Africa and Latin America. Because they are starting in their, in their development path, and in the development path, they can put any efforts that we succeed with today to shame. Nothing can happen. They can, by themselves, produce global warming in the future. So my principles for Copenhagen and a way forward that, over, that involves the following. Overcome the north-south divide. A clean technology transfer, I will explain how. Doing future emissions reductions by developing nations, China and India, using as a foundation existing law, I will explain. And using the clean development mechanism that I explained before as a foundation of a major technology shift in energy use, negative carbon. So there are two parts. The first part is an innovative market solution to overcome the China-US impasse. It's a paradigm shift. It is explained in the Time Magazine article that, you, that was circulated. So I will be short on that. That article is very well written. The editor of Time Magazine called Simon Robinson has a lot of uh, credits in my mind for this. He does, he does, Fiona. Uh, because he made it much more uh, readable and that article explains how you would use a mechanism so that both of them can save face, both of them can move at the same time, which is what we're talking about, instead of each of them waiting for the other one to make the first step. And it's based on a financial mechanism I propose, which is really like interlocking options. It's essentially the US buying an option on their own reductions of emissions by China the China buying an option or a put to limit the downside or insurance on the price that it would be paid. And if you do this properly, the actual exchange is going to be relatively small. Why does it matter? It matters. Why? In talking, as I do, with the advisor, uh, advisor on the environment to President Obama, their critical problem is that for the Senate to approve the already passed House energy bill, it has to pass a crucial budget committee. And the conservatives won't let it pass if there is a lot of money being sent off to China. So you simultaneously have to satisfy Article 4 of the convention and satisfy the US Senate. What's Article 4? Article 4 says, no developing nation will be required to limit emissions unless they are compensated for that. And that's fair. I explained that to you. It's a historical fairness. It makes sense. But in the current situation, imagine what it means for China. You can imagine in the current geopolitical uh, situation 
how the U.S. Senate is going to vote about compensating China, sending money to China. Right? This is a confrontation of two major global powers. Okay? So these bilateral options deal with the problem. First of all, if the U.S. buys a coal, it is promising to make a compensation to China. So that part of Article 4 is satisfied if it goes below the emissions that are already uh, you know, baseline in the protocol. But to overcome the problem with the Senate and to overcome the concern by the Chinese that they will be sailing in a Faustian deal, Faustian, Faustian deal, Faustian, Faustian, huh? Faustian deal. In a Faustian deal, they will be selling their future and their future growth. You need to assure a floor to what they would be paid. That's called buying a put. You guys know about financial markets, right? So the two of them had to buy things from each other. That's a trade. That's, a, that's not my idea. Well, it is, but <laughs> I, no, no, what I mean is the following. The idea of replacing war by trade, I'm sure of students here, who historically said, make trade, not war? It was a British economist, hint, hint, hint. Yes. John Maynard Keynes, as one of the major architects of the post-war reconstruction and the Bretton Woods institutions, although they were taken over by the US afterwards, with why, but he was a major architect. He said, hey, how are we going to stop a third world war? Well, easy, make nations trade, encourage trade. Well, you may notice that the US and China are trading a lot. And this is why when nations really trade a lot with each other, they don't fight wars. They have too much to lose by fighting wars. That was Keynes idea. Well, I have a similar idea. Let China and the US trade here. The trade that I'm talking about is for the rights to emit and the rights to have a floor on the payments. What I'm telling you now is explaining that article that was circulated, and I explained it to 100 nations on April 27, 2009, at the United Nations in a conference on the Kyoto Protocol and CDM for experts in which the representative of the Chinese spoke after I spoke, after I gave my keynote speech, and he criticized me heavily for being too much in favor of the US. Well, I am a US citizen after all. But then at the end he said, and it's recorded, that China agrees with my proposal. This is hopeful. This is the first time the Chinese agree. And this is enough to diffuse the impasse. Read the article that uh, is in Time Magazine and you have more about this. But this is also a market solution with equity and the two sides of the coin. But that is a financial solution. What do I mean by a financial solution? I mean that we can diffuse the war with trade. But then some of us, I would say, or those who are environmentalists will say, well, this is a financial gimmick, right? Okay, these countries are not going to be at war anymore, but be real. How are we going to reduce carbon? That's the issue, right? Okay, so we have to do that. To do that, and to make sure the Chinese are going to sign on the financial agreement I just told you, they have to feel there is a way for them to reduce carbon that is not going to bankrupt them. Those of you that do political economy or politics know that there is one danger that the Chinese government fears more than anything, and this is to stop the continuous growth of their economy, because this could threaten their economic structure and their current economic government is the, is the only thing that can threaten them, as you probably know. China is a poor nation. There are a hundred nations above China in terms of income, so you have to be sensitive to what's going on there. Having said that, Africa, Latin America, and the small island nations can turn carbon negative. Africa emits 3% but they could reduce 20% of the global emissions. If you use the air capture technology that the Royal Academy report has recently uh, uh, put out, of which there are several, and I am one of the uh, business efforts to do it. There is three articles in Nature about air capture that I would also be happy to circulate. One of which is mine, but the other two are not. The cost. I have been doing some computations, and I can explain this when we answer questions. We have you know, 10 minutes to go, and then I'm all yours and his, and yours. So the cost is about $200 billion per year. 
So Nick Stern, sorry, Lord Stern says $100 billion a year. I say 200 because I am pretty ambitious here. I'm saying with $200 billion a year, in 15 years from now, we can eat up, reduce all the 30 gigaton of carbon that humans are injecting into the atmosphere. Okay? And all new plants can be built with this cogeneration feature, so the more energy they produce, the more carbon they reduce, so we don't have the problem anymore. 40% of the global emissions come from power plants. 18% come from meat production. 15% from transportation. And we can produce ethanol and other clean fuels from the CO2 that we capture. I can explain why, how. But the 200 billion a year has two characteristics that I really like. First of all, it is the right global stimulus package right now. It's the right size for what we need. Secondly, and this is different from what Nick Stern is saying as well, is that I don't believe any nation in this climate is going to make a transfer of $200 billion to the developing nations for developing these wonderful plants that suck up carbon while they produce electricity. I just don't believe it. I'm not, nothing personal. It's not cynicism. It's that it hasn't happened, and I don't think it will happen, particularly in this climate. But the carbon market can do it. That's the point of the carbon market. So we have a source of finance that hopefully we can channel to the developing nations to clean for the rest of the world more than what they emit while they are building power plants. So the Kyoto Protocol performs a very important role. It's changing the price system. It's satisfying Oscar Wilde. And at the same time, because the technologies are in the United States, which is still the most innovative nation in the world, with the rampage productivity going up despite the recession and everything else, this will generate technology jobs from Europe, from the United States, and exports for the OECD nations. It will lead to economic growth with carbon reduction. And it's very concrete. I'm not just saying words. I'm saying, I'm telling you how many of these plants you have to build, where to build them, how to change modestly the carbon market and the CDM to achieve this. All you have to do is to create this bilateral trade with China and the United States to get that out of the picture and get them both into the protocol. And then that's a modest change to the carbon market. I can assure you, because I wrote that, those words, and I know how to write these words too. Very simple. And then change the CDM, certification mechanism, so it will accept the negative carbon technologies that the Royal Academy report of June 2009 is talking about, which at present is not possible. Okay? This is what I was saying. We need negative carbon. It can resolve global warming using new power plants that suck carbon from air. And the more power they produce, the more carbon they reduce. There are two building blocks. One is the financial mechanism. And I send you to the Time Magazine article because it's an easy place to read. But I have written this in many other forms. And my book has a longer, a more detailed explanation. And then negative carbon. Negative carbon is crucial because that goes to the real extraction of carbon from the atmosphere. And it favors developing nations with low emissions, which at present have been left out of the equation. They couldn't use the CDM. It's all gone to China. For that, I will send you to Nature. 2008 and 2009 articles. So here is my blueprint for sustainable development. We need clean and abundant energy available worldwide, supporting sustainable growth in developing nations, providing a global market for industrial technology, air capture and solar thermal sources of energy that can be used to reduce atmospheric car carbon. With Kyoto funding, approximately 200 billion for 15 years, that can be used to renovate, renew, the $43 trillion power plant industry infrastructure worldwide. It's a private dash government approach based on industrial technology, financial markets leadership, self-funded, 
and highly profitable new markets with carbon credits as the underlying, based on the Kyoto Protocol CDM or its successors, providing abundant clean energy to stave off the impending energy crisis in developing nations, and mutual beneficial cooperation for the North and the South, the two sides of the coin. Thank you. thought-provoking and engaging presentation there. Um, again, I think very timely given the um, coverage we've seen of the UN summit last week and uh, certainly a sense that we're at something of an impasse here. And, you're, and uh, Professor Cicinetti appears to be offering us a way forward. So at this point, we're going to um, move to the part of the uh, evening where I'm going to invite contributions from the floor. Um, those contributions will be most welcomed that are concise and end in a question for the speaker. So please do uh, make them that, uh, form in that form. Um, we're on camera. This is being recorded. So that's another incentive to uh, behave <laughs> in the best possible way. And um, so can I have a, if you can put your hand up. If you can say um, your name and any affiliation you want to declare, that would be very helpful. So anybody start up there? Gentlemen, if you could wait for the microphone to come to you. There's another gentleman there. Okay. Hello, my name is Bala. I'm from UCL, a research fellow. Uh, I was just wondering. From where? Sorry. From University College London, research fellow. Um, I was just wondering, the recently passed bill in your Congress they say they will reduce the emission by 17 percentage or 20 percentage before 2020, but based on 2005 levels, but not 1990. Would you know why they choose 2005? Because China starts speaking as 2005 levels, so we we actually ignoring the 1990 to 2005 emission levels. Would you know why, Peter? Since 1997. Although the objective to the, of the Kyoto Protocol was to reduce global emissions, emissions have increased tremendously, just the opposite of what was intended. They started decreasing for the people that were participating in the carbon market and the CDM in the year 2005. But the, overall, the trend has been increasing. And as I said, there is a huge leakage here. The leakage means that there is a lot of emitters that are not participating in the protocol. So for that reason, I say, we have reached the point of no return. We can no longer do what we were hoping to do in 1997, which is to reduce emissions. Reducing emissions won't work. Now we have to reduce carbon. Emissions is the flow. Carbon is the stock. We have to actually reduce the carbon in the atmosphere. So we need negative emissions. We need not just to stabilize emissions, but stabilize them and then have a sink globally so the actual carbon in the atmosphere decreases. Otherwise, it's going to be practically impossible to prevent the three, four, and perhaps five degree increase in temperature, with five being generally believed to be catastrophic, four very close by. So does that answer your question? It's an argument about the baseline against which the offer is, which uh, at the moment the U.S. is offering cuts relative to a 2005 oh, baseline. Work. Yeah, no, 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 okay. Both the U.S. and China are making offers that are more symbolic than real. That offer on the part of the U.S. is not what's needed. And the U.S. is thinking, like in the Stern report, that the only way to reduce emissions is to stop energy use at a huge cost, so it's trying to restrain. There is no real understanding of what the profits could be from these new technologies that I was talking about that could really reduce carbon. So there is no consideration of those. Although I've been talking a lot with people in Congress, and there is a lot of people in favor, 
this is by no means generally agreed or established. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking here and everywhere else. But chi China has made a similar offer. Last week, in the General Assembly, China made an offer to decrease the carbon intensity of its product. But between us, that's already happened. Car China has been decreasing its carbon intensity because they were incredibly ineffective, inefficient in the use of carbon in their uh, production system, like the Soviet Union, and for the same reasons. So they are really offering something that they have already done. These are, in a way, what's happening is there is a public uh, persona that these nations are trying to adopt, that they are in favor of doing something, but what they are offering is not really very meaningful. We have to do something much more serious than that. Otherwise, we have reached the point of no return. Thank you. This gentleman up here. Hello, uh, Mark Sloboda, LSE master's student. Um, you, the scientific consensus is that we, up here, sorry. The scientific consensus is that we need to um, reduce uh, carbon parts per million CO2 equivalent in the atmosphere to 350 parts per million. Right now we're at 387 parts per million and going up two to three parts per million per year. Scientists give us 15 years uh, to act on that before uh, the effects of uh, positive feedback effects kick in uh, and we face the climate change death spiral. And you're proposing a market-based solution, which up till now, um, carbon markets have proven uh, a net effect of let reducing carbon emissions so far, um, and a techno fix to geoengineer the planet to our economics, which is still going to do nothing, even if it does miraculously work, about ocean acidification. So what would you say to critics that say the real problem, considering that everything we wear, eat, and own comes from hydrocarbons, um, is made by hydrocarbons, that the real problem is our economic system, our consumption-based society, and our markets themselves. Thank you. Oh, I agree with that. The real problem is our economic system and the way markets have been handling resources until now. I would say the problem that we face of global, the global environmental problems we face of biodiversity, extinction, and global warming and ozone depletion are all provide, produced by what I call market colonialism, which is a market-induced increasing resources extraction by the poor nations and increasing resource consumption for the form that you describe in the industrial nations. And I have, I am not just saying that, I have published that. I have published an article in the American Economic Review, if you can believe that, but it's well understood and accepted that this is a global tragedy of the commons at work because uh, what Lord Stern calls, I identify you, not, not your responsibility, <laughs> what uh, Nick Stern calls the largest market failure ever. So it is well understood that markets have let us down, yes. And I'm not saying just markets, it's the north-south, the combination of international market blowing up through globalization and the fact that developing nations have no private property rights on resources, which are common property, and they have been used as first come, first serve, and they continue to be used, which is what I call market colonialism. I couldn't agree more with you. The only little difference for our opinion, perhaps, I don't even know, is whether we can make a transformation in the market along the lines that were already suggested by Oscar Wilde. Can we align market prices to human values. And if, big if, we can determine and agree, which is what the Kyoto Protocol did first, minimally, but conceptually, agree on a total amount of emissions. How much of the global commons can we use? How much of the global biodiversity can we destroy? We can put a limit on that. And Kyoto did it. It didn't. As I said, there were leakages because there were countries that didn't sign, did not ratify, etc. But if we can do it and get everybody on their board, 
then the question is, can we use the market mechanism with this new goal of restraining our use of the global commons and the global resources in a way that sends the right signals and satisfies Oscar Wilde? I don't think the market is the universal solution, nor do I think that if you just let markets alone, it will solve all our problems. There is a little problem that Oscar Wilde picked up. In our society, we confuse the means with the ends. We like the market because it's a great means of sending price signals. And we thought, ah, well, it's a great way to send price signals. That's the end, to optimize according to markets. Well, that's a little confusion. The market is not the end. It's not about goals. The market is the means. We shouldn't confuse the means with the goals. The goal is to limit our overuse of the global commons, like you said. I am there with you. In the process, I'm saying either you change the market or the market is going to work against you. And I'm saying let's change the market. At least for this, it is working. It is working in a limited way, but it has to be made to work more. It couldn't work some more because the, in 1997, the goals that we put for reductions were very minimal. We need much more serious goals. We need to correct the market externality big time. And we need to introduce new types of markets, kinder markets, markets that value the global commons. Can, can we do it? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. In this case, I think yes. Thank you. This gentleman here in the section. David Evans, philosophy student. I'd like to ask your opinion about an aspect of the problem which you never mentioned. <laughs> We've all heard about greedy bankers causing a collapse of the global system. And I think we need politicians to take a similar attitude to extremely rich people with their extreme carbon footprints. And if, if, if politicians were to set, in leg, set legislation against extreme carbon footprints, that would go a long way to helping the rest of us to reduce our carbon footprints. So in, in other words, at a practical level, we need tax incentives and, and we need heavy fines against, for example, people frequently flying in aircraft between different countries. Like me. We, 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 <laughs> and, and when we have that kind of moral leadership, then the rest of us would find it a great deal easier to reduce our carbon footprints. I'd like, do you, do you think this is good economic logic? First of all, I should mention to both of you that I don't have all the solutions in the world, just to mention that, so that you are aware of my limitations. But having said that, for this one, I have a good answer. I think I do. Here's the story. The Kyoto Protocol is only limiting the global emissions, and it has to do much better than it has done, lower limits, OK, for all nations, and integrate the US and the developing nations and everything. And those are the goals. Then the, the trading is simply a flexibility added on that. But once Kyoto establishes nation by nation those limits, and if you look at the Kyoto Protocol, I have another book that I published after the Kyoto Protocol called Environmental Markets, Equity and Efficiency. And the Kyoto Protocol is reproduced there. And at the end of the Kyoto Protocol, which is 10 pages, 12 pages, there is a table with the numbers that each nation has agreed to emit or reduce emissions, OK? But it doesn't say how each nation is going to get there. In particular, right now, your government, uh, Minister Brown, is proposing ways for a number of institutions to reduce their carbon footprints and trying to have, introduce a system of incentives and penalties. What I'm trying to say is that in the UK, you can have physical limits, you can have carbon taxes, you can have cap and trade, dancing bears, whatever it is that works, to reduce emissions. The Kyoto Protocol is Catholic. By that I mean it doesn't care how you reach those limits. 
in each nation there will be a different cultural, economic, appropriate goal through taxes, through fixed quotas, through moral persuasion, or other ways. That's irrelevant. But what is relevant is the nations compromise with each other to reduce the emissions to a total that is going to keep the atmosphere at safe levels. And as I said to you, it's no longer the case. It's the point of no return. No matter what anybody tells you, we don't have time to reduce emissions. We really have to extract carbon. And I can send you the articles in science, in nature, etc. There is, in among the experts, there is general agreement now that this is the case. That's the lady with the blue scarf there, please. Uh, my name is Veronica Tsako. I'm from the Central European University. Um, my question is about your opinion about the relative importance of energy efficiency measures and um, the solutions outlined in your presentation and about um, how the Copenhagen consensus will solve the usability of CDM in sectors like the building sector with high transaction costs and fragmented market structure. What she's pointing out is that the CDM has very high transaction costs. It takes about two years to get a CDM project approved. And if you are a small project, it's like exhausting. So most projects in small or poor nations in Latin America and Africa <coughs> and in some of the Eastern European countries, they are just so draining in resources, it's not realistic. That's a CDM. The CDM is the, is the transfer that Kyoto Protocol does together with the carbon market to, from rich to poor nation uh, investment in clean projects. And you're right. That's why the CDM recently created the so-called uh, programmatic CDM to try to, as you know, to try to improve that. But in the bottom of that, and this is what I said in UNCTAD, in the Palais de Nation on April 27, the bottom line is that small nations emit too little to qualify to get transfers, see reasonable transfers from the CDM. The CDM is now geared to send funding to the nations that emit a lot. So the worse you behave, the more money you get. That's perverse. What's the solution? And that's what I was talking about, carbon negative. I don't seem to be able to communicate that. You need to make it possible for small nations that don't emit very much, small island nations, African nations, Latin American, and other nations that are not big emitters, to capture more carbon, to reduce carbon more by what, than what they emit. That's called negative carbon. Then they will qualify for big transfers on the CDM. I, you still write, within that, we have to do something about the fixed cost, totally. But it's still the most successful transfer mechanism we ever had because it's for productive purposes and it has moved approximately the same order of magnitude of funds in three years than all the charitable donations in the decade of the 90s. So this is a big way to redress the north-south divide. Okay, um, this gentleman up here in the second row. No, no, sorry, in the next one. Hello and thank you for your lecture. I just have a question concerning uh, a central point you've made of the use of the money gener generated by um, by uh, by the Protocol of Kyoto. Uh, what? Um, yeah. So uh, my question is about um, you focused a lot on uh, how poor nations, uh, African nations, should capture uh, CO2, um, but uh, carbon. So my question is. Knowing that this is a this is a very risky um, this is a very risky um, technology and that there are lots of uncertainties concerning its uh, outcomes, uh, what do you what would you suggest that the Copenhagen um, the the Copenhagen um, agreement uh, how would you suggest it would fund adaptation to climate change? Knowing that these changes are going to happen, whatever we do, um, that's my question. Thank you very much. Where are you from? I'm from uh, France. From France? Yeah, from Sciences Po, yes. From where? Sciences Po University, yeah. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Uh, adaptation is a humanitarian goal. And I'm always in favor of humanitarian goals. 
but it cannot deal with the problem. And if you look at hundreds of millions of people that live in the small island nations or small island states, no adaptation will work. That's why I spoke last week with the president of the Maldives, President Najib, and his UN ambassador, Mohammed, and he gave the most powerful speech at the General Assembly last week. That's a nation that gave the speech called Death of a Nation. He is buying land in India to be able to move his people. Just think about it. We won't be able to adapt in those nations to the sea level rise. Look, there is general agreement now that what we have to do is to reduce the carbon concentration in the atmosphere and to extract. That is the best form of adaptation. Beyond that, I'm all in favor of humanitarian measures. But just for these people, for this public, <coughs> in the year 2010, we expect 50 million climate change uh, migrants, people displaced, displaced for climate change, 50 million in 2010. In the year 2012, it's going to be 200 million. I know it's very difficult to believe or even to understand these numbers when you go out in the street and it's a beautiful evening in London and the world seems to be you know, in perfect good shape. But that's what we're facing. So we have to do something about it. It's do or die. Hello, um, my name is Carolina. I'm a politics student, not here, um, at Warwick University. And I want to touch upon a bit of what everyone has sort of mentioned, but hasn't, what you haven't mentioned in your presentation. Maybe that's because it's on a different topic, but consumer behavior and transmitting this message culturally to people so that they realize the urgency of the problem. Um, I think one of the main reasons that the waxman marquee bill is going to face so much problems now passing through, through um, the Senate, a new version, this version, is because it does not have the political capital behind it. People don't want it. And the problem I have with your solution is that it doesn't, or maybe you haven't mentioned it, but I would like to know from you, how can we actually change people's mentalities? And how can we, because that has to be sort of the crux of the issue at some point. Um, and it relates back to the question that the guy up there had on the market economy and that kind of thing. Um, and just to throw something else out there, the fact that I heard recently that maybe, you know, China has more of a, of a chance of passing a cap and trade bill before the U.S. because it's a command and control economy and because basically they can just say what they, you know, what goes. So I want to hear your views a bit more on how to change people's mentalities, basically. That's a very good question. All of them are very good questions. Thank you very much. Um, I, I guess I, was, I didn't spend enough time uh, explaining a large part of my work is about that issue. I do believe that market prices are one signal which is very powerful to make people change in the way they consume and they behave. No, I don't just believe that. I firmly believe that. Not only I firmly believe that, I have demonstrated it. For example, after, just to give you one example, after the first and the second oil OPEC shocks, price shocks, I have a book published by Oxford University <coughs> Press called Oil and the International Economy, and I showed that the, the uh, oil intensity of a unit of GDP in the United States decreased by 70% in three years due to the two and a half, 2.5 times change in prices. In the last two years, the American consumer, you are American, yes? No, well, you are a student in Warwick. You are British? I'm Brazilian. Brazilian, okay, American. <laughs> okay, so in the, in the last two and a half years, the consumer has destroyed the car industry in the United States. Destroyed it. The car industry in the United States 
used to be the first one in the world. Ford was the largest sales, uh, sales in the world in automobiles. <coughs> first, he lost to Mazda. Sorry, to, uh, yeah, I think to Mazda. <coughs> no, to Toyota. And then Toyota went down, too. But I used to teach three years ago to students such as you, and they were saying, the US consumer loves, is, has a love affair with the large cars and with the SUVs. This is never going to change, never going to change. When the price of petroleum in the US changed to become close to the European price, which is historically two and a half times higher than in, in Europe than in the United States, as you probably know, when it just became two and a half times higher, the SUVs went bankrupt across the board. This famous US consumer who had his love affairs with the SUV stopped buying SUVs. And the companies that were producing SUVs stopped producing it. Simple. The market signal, the price signal, is very, very important. That's how you communicate to the consumer. You communicate culturally, you communicate through values, you communicate through poetry, you communicate through the pictures that I showed you about our cousins in evolution that are going extinct, like the polar bears and what's happening. You do communicate. But at the end of the day, the price signal communicates more rapidly and more efficiently than anything I know to take us away from this overconsumption of resources that we have been engaged since World War II, since the period of runaway globalization uh, with the wrong market prices, with the largest market failure of our time, which is what Nick Stern said, is our overconsumption of fossil fuels. Am I wrong? You're absolutely right. <laughs> and by the way, he's not, uh, I, I only <laughs> met him today. But this is, <laughs> and by the way, that's Nick Stern, who is not, you know, personally related to me anyway, although we know each other well. So the point I'm trying to make is that's how you communicate to the consumer. There may be other ways through religion, through poetry, through literature, through movies, education, music, everything. But you know what? The price signal acts fast. So that's good. Let's use it. Now, you are saying two things. On the one hand, is how are we going to communicate to the consumer? The price signal. Where's the price signal coming from? It comes from the market, carbon market. That's what the carbon market is. You put a boundary on how much of the global em uh, environment you can produce, and if it includes everybody, then if you overconsume, you have to pay. It's like a tax. But instead of giving money to the government, you give it to, all, to those who sell, who are the ones that have gone under their quota. So the bad guys pay the good guys directly. That's a price signal, and it works. It works. It worked very successfully in the U.S. to stop the problem of ozone depletion through the sulfur, um, the sulfur dioxide, and the, the ozone, etc. But the sulfur dioxide is particularly a good example because 15 years ago, the Chicago Board of Trade introduced a cap and a trade on sulfur dioxide by the major utilities in the U.S. and they were able to resolve the problem very quickly and very successfully. Sulfur dioxide, however, is not a common, it's not a public good. I can explain why. It doesn't diffuse uniformly. It, it, it goes in different pockets. But nevertheless, the market did work very successfully. And there are other examples, too. So that's how. But the next question you ask is a little bit more demanding, and it's connected to what the two of you are thinking. And it's like, well, it, it looks like you're saying, let's go back business to usual. Markets are going to solve everything. And clearly, something doesn't work because the market didn't solve everything. So there is like a diffuse question in the back of your mind about this sounds too easy somehow. The market are responsible for what? It does, you know, we have a major problem in our hands. How can we just say, oh yeah, the market is going to solve it? Don't we have to change our economic system, our culture? Well, I have to tell you, this is perhaps not the time to talk about it, but I mentioned a book I wrote about this topic. Environmental Markets, Equity and Efficiency, Cambridge, sorry, Columbia University Press, year 2000. In, I, I wrote that with a number of colleagues that include the lead negotiator of the Kyoto Protocol, 
The chairman and my colleague of the Stanford Department of Economics, Jeffrey Hill, who is an author of, uh, a British author that used to teach at Cambridge, etc., etc. If you look at it, what we are, all these people are saying is that environmental markets are different than the regular markets we are used to. And without going into details, this is not the right place for it, they are so different that in my mind, environmental markets are the most important markets of this century, and by themselves, they are so different, they're going to change capitalism. It's the tail that wags the dog. That's what I think. Good. This gentleman here in the white jumper, please. Hello, my name is Jörg Leib uh, from the Grantham Institute of Climate Change and Imperial College London. My question is as follows. Um, how major do you think is uh, the air capture technology the Royal Society refers to? Sorry? How major do you think is the air capture technology the Royal Society refers to? And do you see any risks in adopting this technology on a global scale? So you're, you're asking about the, um, the capture technology that's described in the Royal Society report. You're saying that it's unproven, so how risky would it be to depend so heavily on it? Is that, is that right? Yes. Well, is your point of view that it is risky? It is the Royal Academy of Sciences' point of view, after studying the matter very carefully, that it is not. So read it. <laughs> no, it's not my opinion, but just a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, this is the response. <laughs> <laughs> That's a uh, fairly definite, uh, definitive response. Uh, can we have a question here? This is maybe here. Good evening. My name is Vida Filmanovicuda and I'm a founding member of the Baltic Vision Group. My question is whether it would be worth, first of all, looking at changing the current markets that we have in place. And the reason for saying that is because I would attribute a lot of the Chinese carbon emissions to the consumption in the US and the EU. And um, uh, carbon emissions in the US and EU, a lot of them come rather, for, rather than from production, from consumption processes and as a, from the users, from the end users. Whereas in China, being a very poor country, a lot of the people do not consume um, even, even, for, um, even close amounts of um, goods to produce carbon emission um, anywhere near like in US and EU and if the Chinese did want to live like the Americans do um, it would become um, a massive tragedy of our times and this could really be the end. Thank you. Yeah, in fact that's, that question underlines my entire presentation and maybe I didn't succeed in communicating it. But I did say, maybe you remember this, I did say that if all people in the world were consuming energy and emitting what the average person in the developing nation consumes and emits, there would be no global warming problem. Do you remember me saying that? Okay. That's what you are repeating. You are repeating that in China, they're consuming much less energy, they are emitting much less, and I can give you the numbers. In terms of energy consumption, the average Chinese consumes approximately one-tenth of what the average OECD citizen consumes, one-tenth. In terms of emissions, is one-sixth, because the Chinese economy is less efficient in terms of uh, uh, energy use. So you're absolutely right, we are in agreement, <coughs> And I actually, my whole presentation is based on that because it, I said that historically, the problem emerges from the rich nation's consumption and the numbers show it. And the, the developing nations are at the receiving end of this problem. Not only they're not responsible for the problem, but they couldn't solve it if they tried because they emit relatively little today. So we are in agreement there. Uh, gentleman up here at the front. Yeah. Uh, uh, wait for the uh, microphone, please. Hi, I'm Sidhan, and I'm LSC. 
Um, could you elaborate more on clean energy sources and clean en uh, technology transfers? And also, you did not emphasize anything on development of clean energy sources because solar energy sources are just 28 conversion efficiency. So maybe development, if we laid a greater emphasis on developing that technology source, we could have actual results of its implementation. Um, okay, the nature of this presentation forces me to go light in what I say technically. And if I, I am by nature, I'm a mathematician, and I'm a scientist, and I am a co-inventor of one of these technologies, so that I mentioned. There are several others, so I'm not the only one, but, so I'm very technically inclined. But if I start talking technically, I lose the public very quickly, so I have to restrain myself. It is my pleasure to answer your question, but perhaps outside, so that I don't glaze the eyes of the rest of the audience. But generally speaking, the point that I made is very important to keep in mind. Neither nuclear, nor hydroelectric, nor wind, nor thermal energy have the scope, geothermal, have the scope to replace the fossil fuel energy that we use in the world today. They just don't have it. There is not enough sources. Solar by itself does. But by nature, this is a problem that doesn't have a single solution. Nor should any problem under uncertainty. You might have heard about the portfolio diversification problem. We do have uncertainty. We have to follow a portfolio diversification, which in this case means different technologies, different sources, different approaches. We just have to do that right and do it soon. But I will be pleased to talk in more detail about the technology when we go outside. Unless you have any specific question, I can answer very quickly. Can you elaborate more on technology transfer? Yes. Technology transfer is the most fascinating topic. And it is the requirement of the G77 made in the, in the G20 meeting in Pittsburgh approximately, what was it, a month ago? in the, the General Assembly. The G77 in the G20 meeting in Pittsburgh, in the General Assembly, made, not, last, not, not, in, not the New York meeting, but the Pittsburgh meeting, made the, fol made the following request. They said, we need two things. We need financial, we need technological or technical assistance. What they mean by technical assistance is technology transfer. It's what you call technology transfer. That's what we need. But we need also financial assistance because you can have the best technology and the best scientists in the world, but if you don't have money to develop the power plants and the technology, you won't succeed. So you need both. That's where the Kyoto Protocol comes yeah. handy because through the CDM, it encourages technology transfer that cleans the atmosphere, as I said before. That's what it is for technology transfer. It's the CDM of the Kyoto Protocol. And by using the carbon market, it makes resources available. But it has to be improved, because at present, as I said, it's acting perversely. And it is actually providing incentives to the largest emitters. <coughs> it's giving, sending more money to China. We have time for one more question. And it's this gentleman here with the structure. Hello there. I'm um, Shane Harrison, and I don't know, I suppose I could say I'm friends of the earth, if anything, but kind of just happily sitting in on the lecture here. I don't know. I wanted to do something a little bit different that will end in a question, but I'm going to read my current Facebook status because it's kind of got a, a, almost exactly what You're you've been You're going to have to be very brief, succinct. No, got, uh, just sure. a couple of minutes, please. Albert, our instinctual needs are as out of phase with the modern social environmental context as an amphibian's mutation, mutational adaptations are in comparison to a fish from which it was derived. In turn, the temperance of morality is also cognitively outdated, indeed distorted, as distorted as the distance from the transient sum pro uh, product of imperatives required for group survival, which is what you're talking about, group survival. And what we've been discussing, I'm so happy to hear that somebody's going to be um, getting down to the point which is we're all going to die pretty much if we don't come to this. Would it be possible to 
elaborate um, any more upon how you are going to be able to facilitate this kind of like your your actual direct input into um, Copenhagen and how this report's going to be summarized please thank you thank you I must confess I didn't hear a lot of the beginning but <laughs> but I heard the end so what I'm doing is the following first of all once you become part of the process you're stuck because the incentives for staying in the status quo are too strong in the diplomatic structure, in the government structure, in the business structure, etc. So you have to be very nimble and try to simultaneously stay outside and be able to feed ideas into the inside. So I tell you how I did it in Kyoto. I, I call it agitating. But it's a funny way of agitating. It's a scientific agitation. So I write. I talk in the United States, I spoke, and I, I am speaking now, with 41 members of Congress, because they're going to be the lawmakers from the US that are going to have to understand and support this. There is a committee called uh, Sustainable Energy and Environment, led by Representative Jay Inslee. So I made presentations, I organized to that committee. I organized a bilateral, uh, sorry, a bipartisan, not that bipartisan uh, briefing to US Congress and the Senate, myself, bringing the crucial, crucial people there. I am giving speeches like this to young people and to people who are uh, representatives of the developing nations governments, either in the negotiations or ambassadors outside, so that the general ideas permeate. I write articles, so uh, with the help of some of the people in the audience, uh, in addition to publishing the book Saving Kyoto, that if you read, you will see it has a lot of explanations about this. Uh, I, I explain what the problem is. I explain what the solutions are. I write in Time Magazine. I received a response from an organizer in Copenhagen saying that my proposal printed in Time Magazine uh, that you will have available here is right on target, according to somebody who is in Copenhagen. I'm working with the small island nations who are the smallest nations and the ones that are most threatening, threatened in this, in this process. I'm also trying to talk with President Obama's advisors. Not trying to talk, I talk with them. They listen, they discuss, they tell me their domestic problems. I try to help solve the problem in the US and explain to them that to take the marquee bill, that's another question you asked, but I didn't answer. How to take the marquee bill, which is the energy bill, through the Senate, because that part is missing. I tell you how. The Senate, interestingly enough, has pointed out they're using the following words to vocalize their concern. They're saying, if China is not going to reduce emissions, why should we unilaterally do so? Why should we adopt the energy bill until China agrees to reduce their emissions? So I spoke with the environmental advisor of President Obama, and I said, that is a good reason to reach an agreement with China and Copenhagen. So when you come back from Copenhagen, you destroy the argument of the conservative senators who don't want to, who don't want to confirm or ratify the energy bill. So in fact, the conservatives in the United States are helping the United States go beyond its uh, somewhat provincial nature and understand the importance of the global negotiations. For that reason, the, the United States has decided to postpone taking the energy bill through Congress, so through Senate, until after Copenhagen, so that you understand. This is, it's all very complex. So I'm working with the US Congress. I'm working with a group of small island nations. I work with the United Nations that I have worked for 25 years. I write books, I write articles, and then I talk with people like you. And you are my preferred public because you are the people that are going to make it happen. And if you read the middle of the book that uh, is here, the Saving Kyoto, it is my personal step-by-step -step approach about how to change the world if you have to. It's almost a joke, but not quite. Thank you very much.